All right, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Emily and I'm the Marketing Director for Clink Scales Elder Law Practice. We are a firm with main offices in Hayes and Wichita, serving clients everywhere in between that really focuses on helping clients answer questions and issues regarding aging, chronic illness, long-term disabilities, and more. We are very excited to bring you this webinar today entitled, Eight Things You Need to Know for the Second Half of Life. Please feel free to send any questions you may have to me in the chat box that's located at the bottom of your screen. At the very end of this presentation, we will address any of those questions that you may have. Also, if you have any additional questions you'd like to discuss with Randy or a member of our staff, we will open up our breakout rooms afterwards. So what this means for you is that you will have a chance to speak privately with a member of our staff about your situation or unique question. At the conclusion of this presentation, we will also send out a quick survey link in that chat box where you can fill out your information in order to request your free book or your free strategy session. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Randy Klinkscales, and I'll hand it over to him now to get us started. Thank you, Emily. Um, uh, Randy Klinkscales, and we're, today we're going to talk about the secrets you need to know for the second half of life. Um, and uh, as Emily said, at the end, uh, we're going to uh, uh, talk to you about how to contact our office. Before I before I get to that, uh, I want to make sure everybody can see our slideshow. Uh, and there's a chat box that Emily mentioned. And uh, Emily, if you'll, you'll put that up and you can go to that chat box and just check uh, yes or no, if you can uh, see that. Um, uh, and just let me know that you can uh, see uh, the slideshow. Okay. Yeah, it looks like everybody's uh, able to see that. Uh, if you have problems uh, during the session, uh, uh, feel free to contact our office at 785-625-8040. Now, let, let me um, uh, talk about what, what, are, what are you going to discover today? Um, and so the uh, you're going to discover today important components and considerations for your long-term plan, uh, ways to preserve and protect your assets, uh, how to avoid paying too much money to the government, and ways to stay at home. Um, and before I go on, I wanted to tell you, you know, this was probably the, my biggest struggle was putting this uh, program together and trying to hold it down to the 45 or 50 minutes. Uh, there's just so much stuff here that's really important uh, to me. Uh, and, and what I find is so many times uh, people wait until there's a crisis before they do anything. Uh, and, and so trying to compact this and, and, and urging you to take action is, is important to me. One, one of the, there are eight secrets um, uh, that I want you to be aware of. Uh, I've kind of interspersed them throughout the, the workshop today. Uh, let me, and, you, and I'm going to share those with you by way of examples, but let me just hit on them real quick. I know this is not part of the slideshow, but uh, number one was protect yourself uh, with good foundation documents. Uh, number two is minimize others' liabilities. Uh, three is update your beneficiary designations. Uh, four is engage in special needs planning. Five is protect your assets from the cost of long-term care. Uh, six is know the enemy, that being taxes. Seven is understanding the IRA stretch out. And then eight, realizing there are options to stay at home. So I got them in. And so you're gonna hear them throughout uh, what, what I'm doing today. So this is for you if you're wondering if you need some type of estate planning and whether your current plan is adequate, if you're concerned about what happens if you become incapacitated, uh, if you're worried about your family and how can you protect them, uh, whether it's kids or other people in your family, 
concerned how your property could be should be divided. Uh, is it to be divided equally? Is it to be defi be divided equitably? Uh, that's two different things. Um, th that's an important discussion. Wondering how to preserve and protect your resources. Uh, concerned about long-term care costs and what that would do your, to your planning. Uh, if you're wanting to pass on a business or property to your family, or if you're wanting to stay at home and out of the nursing home. One, one of the things, I, before I get to this, one, one of the things that I like to ask my clients when they come in to visit with me is after we, we talk about their health, we talk about their finances, and I ask them to imagine if you could make a, if you could wave a wand, uh, what would you want? Another way I say it is, after this discussion, what do you think your goals are? What are you concerned about? And, and these are kind of typical in, in most every case. Uh, they want to stay at home as, they, as you age, as they age. They want to be sure that their wishes are, are followed, even if they f lose capacity. They want to stay in control as long as possible. Uh, they want to pass on a legacy to their family. They don't want to lose property because of government taxes. Uh, they, they, they're, they don't want to worry about losing property to long-term care costs. And they just really want to have peace of mind that everything's arranged. Um, I, I wanted to share with you, this is a, a lady that wrote me a, a nice note. Um, Came to, came to me several years ago. Uh, we've worked with her uh, until very, very recently uh, when her husband passed away, but came to us uh, because her husband had Parkinson's and she was kind of at her wits end. She really wanted to keep him at home. She didn't know how to do that. She was concerned about how to pay for in-home care, how to pay for care if he went into a nursing home. So we were able to, to keep him at home for a very long time. We found resources for her to help her out at home. Uh, we were able to then, when he needed to transition uh, to the nursing home, uh, show her how to pay for care uh, without going broke. So her comments were uh, as follows. Uh, My husband has Parkinson's. You helped me keep him at home as long as possible. You showed me how to be a better caregiver I could not have figured out how to pay for care with Medicare and Medicaid on my own. And then she went on to say that I highly recommend your office. So who the heck am, am I? Um, uh, I figured out who put the uh, chimpan chimpanzee in this slide. It was my assistant, uh, Ashley, so I'm holding her responsible. Uh, but just in the way of background, I'm an attorney in Hayes and Wichita. Uh, we have offices in both places, but we practice really over the Western two thirds of the state. Uh, I'm an elder care attorney. And, and what does that mean? Uh, I focus on uh, aging and chronic care issues, uh, families that are facing that. Uh, I uh, help people get estate plans in place so that they, they don't have to worry about long-term care costs. Um, been practicing, this is now my, my 41st year, but the last 16 years have been the best and you'll kind of figure that out why in a, in a moment. Um, I am married, I, this is my wife and my three sons, uh, my wonderful daughter-in-law and my, my uh, best grandsons in the world. Uh, Alex, who uh, is there on the right, uh, is my best buddy and uh, Max on the left, who was just born in May, and we woke him up uh, from his nap to, to take this, this photograph. Uh, why am I so passionate? And I am passionate about this, and, uh, and it really, uh, my passion was ignited uh, taking care of my grandmother. And I, I, I had practiced law for about 20 years when uh, uh, all of a sudden my mom passed away, who was caring for my grandmother. And so all of a sudden, I was the next relative. I was the lawyer. Uh, I, was, I, I was put in charge of my grandmother. And so she lived in Fort Worth, Texas, and I lived in Hayes. And we you know, tried to work out a plan to keep her in her home as long as possible. 
and some of the lessons that I learned along the way, uh, and those lessons actually completely changed our office. Uh, and, I, and I truly mean that. We actually have a picture of my grandmother in my office, and everybody in my office knows the story of my grandmother. But she wanted to be independent. Uh, she wanted to stay out of the nursing home. She wanted to protect uh, her assets uh, so that she could maintain the style that she wanted. Uh, I learned that as a caregiver of my grandmother, I needed assistance. I also learned that uh, the form documents that my grandmother had uh, that were prepared by a Texas attorney were not adequate. Uh, they did not fulfill, they did not reflect my grandmother's goal, goals. It's important that I, lear I learned from my grandmother. It's important to have a plan, but that that plan is going to be different as you grow older. So the plan that I would have had for my grandmother, if I was her attorney when she was 30, would be a lot different than I had for her when she was 60 or 70 or 80 or 90. Uh, also understand that the journey is ever changing uh, and the laws are ever changing and it can be complicated. And it needs, sometimes it needs to be tweaked or even completely redone, uh, the plan does. But the journey can be wonderful. Uh, and, and in my grandmother's case, it, it really was and very rewarding. So I wanna share an, another story with you. This is uh, Mr. Woods that he came in to see me, uh, this was years ago, uh, worked, again, worked with the family for many years, um, still work with the family. Uh, uh, his wife had gotten sick. Um, he and his son came in to see me and they were really worried about the farm. They were really worried about how to pay for care for, for Mrs. Woods. Uh, and so we were able to show them how they could uh, keep the farm, uh, pay for care and, and pass the farm on to the family. So Mr. Woods wrote me a nice note. It says, when my wife got sick and needed the nursing home, I was told I would have to sell my home and my farm. I thought I would go broke. Randy saved my farm for me and my children. A, a comprehensive long-term plan is essential uh, for our second half of life to establish, preserve, and protect our wishes. And so what do I mean by that a little bit? You know, I think the first half of life is, for me, was, uh, raising my children, uh, getting them through high school, um, and, and um, getting them off to college. Uh, but after that point, I, I really considered that I was in the second half of life. And, and so the goals become a little bit different in the sense that when my children were, were under 18, my goals were really to be sure that if something happened to me, that my wife would be able to support herself and raise our children financially. Uh, but th things change as we grow older. So what are we going to discover today? It's more about, than a, it's more about uh, form and cookie cutter estate planning documents if you're really going to plan for the second half of life. Your goals need to be reflected in your plan. Uh, again, as in my grandmother's case, in Mr. Wood's case, the, the plan needs to reflect what the goals are at that stage of life. You can decide what needs to be protected, if anything. Uh, you can protect your family members. Uh, and we'll talk about different concerns that you may have. Uh, you don't have to go broke if you need long-term care. Uh, with careful planning, you can avoid unnecessary taxes. And just to let you know, there's been a lot of changes this year in tax laws. Um, and we're going we're gonna to touch on those briefly. Uh, it's really important to express your desires and, and ways to stay at home. Uh, it's one thing to say, I want to stay at home. It's another, another way, another thing to actually implement tools that allow you uh, to stay at home. And we're, we'll talk about that. So there are important components to your estate plan. And, and th there are 
that, that they need to be included in your estate plan. There are fundamental documents that need to express your wishes. It's, a, it's important to make correct beneficiary designations, like on your IRAs, on your accounts and the like, to be sure they fit with your plan and go where you want it to go. I had a case one time where we had a family where mom uh, left certain accounts uh, to the three daughters. Uh, each daughter got a different account and then mom died and there was no will, they just had that designation. And so then the daughters fought over uh, who was gonna pay for mom's funeral uh, because they all had uh, bones to pick, I guess, if you will, uh, uh, and, and didn't wanna use their, their own money that they had inherited from their mom. So, and there's ways you can protect family members and, and special needs planning is important. Uh, so this is one of my favorite story. Some of you, does anyone remember James Dean? If you would just check yes in the box or, or no. I, it'd be, I'm curious how many people know who James Dean is. And Emily, can you just kind of show me the chat box there? So just go to the chat box and check if you know who James Dean is. Okay. Well, let me, let me just give a, a brief, uh, brief review. Uh, we, have, we have quite a few yeses and thumbs ups. Okay, great, okay. So James Dean, as you know, was a, a famous actor, very short-lived, um, uh, died in 1955. He had not married, he had no children. Uh, his mother had predeceased him. He had no will or trust. Uh, he was estranged from his father. He and his father just did not get along, had not spoken in uh, several years. Uh, he did not have a will when he died. And under something called it, it, intestate law, his father was his only heir. And so as a result of not having a will, all his property, uh, which is about $100,000 in 1955, that was probably pretty sizable, uh, went to his father. But more importantly, uh, his name went to his father and all the rights to his name went, went to his father. And in 2014, that estate was still worth about $4 million. So the one person he really didn't want his property to go to, that's where it went. Uh, and, and, only, and that's only because he had not ever expressed in a will or a trust uh, what he uh, wanted to do. So I want to tell you a story about a client that came in uh, uh, just a while back. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jackson came in, and he's 66 and she's 69. Um, he's still working. Uh, Mrs. Jackson is retired. They own a home and have a family business. They had investments in a retirement fund of about $400,000 that retirement fund and investments were set up to pay on death to each other than it said to our four children. Uh, they're relatively healthy. They have no estate plan. Uh, they have four children, had four children. Son Bud is married with two children uh, and he works in their business that they own uh, and he hopes to take it over and they hope for him to take it over. Son Mark is deceased and has a special needs child. Uh, daughter Debbie is going through a divorce and has one child. And daughter Barbara has been in and out of drug rehab program, is divorced with two children who live with their father. So when they came in to see me, uh, I mean, their goals were they want the business to stay in the family, they want to be fair to all the children and they really want to avoid litigation. They want something to go to their grandchildren. And so when I sat down with them, the comment that they made was, we don't know where to start. So I pointed out to them that with no power of attorney, uh, if something happens to one of them capacity-wise, no one has any power to act. And, and why that's important is there's a misconception out there that if I'm married 
that if something happens to me capacity wise, my wife can take action for me. And that's simply not true. There's a perception out there that if something happens to my 32 year old son, I have the right to make decisions for him if he doesn't, if he's not married. And that's just not correct. Unfortunately, Kansas is a, is a state that unless you have a power of attorney for someone, you have no power to act on their behalf, the exception being a minor child. But anyone that's an adult needs a power of attorney. Uh, I also pointed out to them that, and, that, and that's, that's for healthcare decisions, that's for financial decisions. I also pointed out to them that they would have to go through probate. And generally probate is going to cost a percentage of their estate. That's generally how most probated attorneys charge. I also pointed out to them that if something happened to both of them, that everything's going to be divided into four parts equally. And as a result of that, they could end up losing the business. Because as an example, Debbie is going through the divorce and that her share of the business could be lost to the divorce. Uh, Barb has drug issues uh, and uh, uh, you know, her access to cash is, is, or a business is gonna be devastating. They have a disabled uh, child from uh, the deceased son and if, if that disabled child inherits money from them, that child will be disqualified from benefits. And the investments go to the children, including the deceased child. And so that needs to be fixed. So as a solution, what we did is we set up powers of attorneys uh, uh, with really good agents. And, and, and that was, you know, be kids or, 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 well, first it was their spouse, but the kid that they thought was most responsible and we added 14 additional powers so that, that that agent could carry out their wishes. We put in their power of attorneys what their health desires are. So what kind of services do they want? What kind of services do they not want? What if they develop dementia? What if they, you know, what, whatever. We addressed a, lo a lot of those in their powers of attorneys. We also set up a revocable trust to manage their property if they lose capacity and it avoids probate and it reduces the chance of litigation. We said in there in that we said in the trust that Bud gets the business and everything else is divided between the other family members. But we expressed in there why he is getting that business so as to avoid probate. We actually protected Debbie's inheritance from divorce by holding it into in a special subtrust. We set up a special needs trust for Mark's child, thus protecting uh, the child from getting kick off, kicked off of benefits. And we protected Barbara's inheritance from her drug problems. Uh, and we fixed the beneficiary designations so it went to where they really intended it to go. Uh, so at the end, I, I thought it was interesting. They said, thanks so much for your help. We really didn't know uh, what we didn't know. Uh, and uh, those are always kind of interesting folks to work with. Uh, and it's nice to know that, that, that uh, they really are unaware of, of what issues are out there. And so by a long visitation with them, we can figure out what all the issues are and then design a, a solution. So what do you need to do is to meet with our office regarding a strategy session and together we'll work to determine your goals and concerns. Then we're, we want to explore what options might be available to you. Some people have different options available based on their health, based on their resources, based on their family situation. It's absolutely essential that we get strong documents in place uh, right away so if something happens that we can continue the planning process. And we want to start the, the strategy right away to avoid roadblocks or changes in circumstances. So as an example, a change in your health could mandate uh, a change in our plan, but it could also close the door on some options that 
might otherwise be available to us. So let's talk about uh, ways to preserve and protect your assets from long-term care costs. And why are we talking about this? You know, today, um, you know, we, uh, one of my care coordinators, Kayla, and I were visiting with somebody yesterday, and he thought long-term care costs were between three and five thousand dollars, when in fact uh, they're they're between six and eight or nine thousand dollars, and sometimes they're higher. And so, in the course of a year, it's very conceivable that you could go through a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, or, or thereabouts uh, in, in long-term care costs. So with planning, you can protect what's important to you. Uh, you can make a decision on how you want to pay for care. Sometimes, you know, with some of my clients is just saying, you know, we're gonna set aside a, a pool of money uh, and, and that's how we're gonna pay for long-term care. But the thing about it is you need to understand you don't have to go broke uh, just because you need long-term care. And we're gonna talk about today one particular case where uh, we, we showed the family how to use government benefits to pay for care such as Medicare, uh, VA pension and Medicaid. So let's talk about a situation where we're using planned resources to pay for care. So Mr. and Mrs. Johnson came in and Mr. Johnson's had a stroke. And by the way, he had a little bit dementia a little bit of dementia before the stroke and pretty significant after the stroke. Uh, but he's still in the hospital. The hospital's wanting to discharge him. Uh, the, the, the Johnsons have a home uh, in investment and a business worth about $500,000. They have long-term care insurance of $200 a day uh, for three years. Uh, they're, they were concerned about how to pay for care, what would happen when the long-term care policy was used up, and they wanted to preserve something for, their, for uh, the, each other and, and their children. So again, uh, you know, Mrs. Johnson's a little bit worried about, more than a little bit worried about running out of money, and she was really, more focused on that worry. But what we showed her was that if we could discharge Mr. Johnson to a skilled facility, Medicare would pay for that for a period of time. More importantly, by trans transitioning him to a skilled facility, he would get the necessary health services, which would allow him to get better. And then we could actually transition him to home, continue with some home care, but we could get the long-term care policy to pay for some outside assistance for the home care and the home improvements so that Mr. Johnson would be safe. And we would be able to stretch out the long-term care policy because we wouldn't necessarily be using $200 a day for at-home care. So the early involvement with Mrs. Johnson and Mr. Johnson really accomplished four things. We got Medicare uh, benefits extended. Uh, we got uh, health improvements for Mr. Johnson that he really needed. Uh, Mr. Johnson was able to return home and the long-term care policy was extended, uh, thereby uh, pr protecting assets. So let's talk about another example. And this is a little bit more of a proactive uh, approach. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Schmidt uh, were 72 and 70. Uh, so this case actually came up about four years ago. Uh, they were recently retired. Mr. Schmidt had $350,000 in an IRA. Mrs. Schmidt had about $200,000 in her IRA. They had investments of $300,000, a home, three children, and, and five grandchildren. And so their thought to me, their, what they expressed to me, is we want to protect each other. They're concerned that if one gets sick, assets are gonna be depleted, and their spouse will be impoverished, and they want to leave some money to their children. Let me add one more fact. 
uh, about a year before they came in to see me, they had purchased some traditional long-term care insurance. And that was costing them about $7,000 a year. And it provided about $3,500 of, of um, coverage uh, for, I think, three years. So they were upset that they were paying so much in premiums. They didn't like the idea of having to pay premiums the rest of their lives. Um, and it was a, they knew they didn't have adequate coverage. And they knew that if they never used the policy, then they, they lost all the money. So what we did, and one of the tools in our toolkit that we showed them was a, that we could actually take uh, uh, $150,000 of Mr. Schmidt's IRA with a tax-free exchange and buy $250,000 of life insurance. And that life insurance had a long-term care rider for five years that paid $7,000 a month. And there was no more annual, annual premium. If they never used the long-term care, when they both died, the family was going to get $250,000. If they had a claim on the policy, that claim just reduced the death benefit. So let's assume they had a claim of $50,000 for long-term care. You would deduct that from $250,000. So when they died, the family would still get $200,000. So that was a great solution for them. Uh, and they were thrilled not to have to pay that uh, annual premium of $7,000 a month. They were thrilled it was a tax-free exchange. Uh, and they were really happy with the fact that they would get some money back if they didn't use the policy. Interesting, and this is not unusual, it was actually their children that brought them in to see us because they knew their parents really need planning. I wanna throw something out at you, kind of interesting to me. Uh, I, I do this thing with financial advisors and I did a poll one time about how many of their, their clients have an estate plan. And 70% of their clients did not have an estate plan. So these are people with money uh, that need to be help, that, that needs help managing it or investing it, but still don't have an estate plan. So if you're in that 70%, you're not an aberration. You're in the, in the majority, uh, but they knew that uh, these financial advisors knew that they're, their people needed to get some type of estate plan done. I want to give you a, another couple of examples, but let's talk with, about the Lundgrens first. And this is a fairly recent case. So the Lundgrens came in to see me. Uh, they'd actually been to a neurologist. Uh, Mr. Lundgren, uh, their farming family, he's been diagnosed with early signs of dementia, uh, uh, with signs of dementia, early cognitive decline. But he's still very active. He's a still a very active farmer. He still has capacity. Uh, uh, he's, he's concerned about what happens if years from now he needs care. He is concerned for his uh, wife and his children. But I think the overall desire of Mr. Lundgren and Mrs. Lundgren is that Mr. Lundgren wants to stay in control, but I, but he wants, but he said, I want to stay in control, but I want to be sure my wife and my land are protected. But Mr. Lundgren wanted to continue to farm. He wanted to carry on as long as he could. So what we did is we set up broad powers of attorney for Mr. Lung, Mr. and Mrs. Lundgren. We put their land into an irrevocable trust we added Mrs. Lundgren's, Mr. Lundgren's care instructions to his health care prior of attorney. And we met with his agents so that they know his wishes. The result is though it may be several years before Mr. Lundgren ever needs health care assistance, his goals are achieved through his plan. Uh, his land is protected. He remains in control. And if, if something happens, 
his wife has the power through the power of attorney to further protect his resources. And his care goals are protected. And what I mean by that, he's expressed what type of health care he wants uh, uh, at a time when he cannot make the decision. And that really helps take a lot of pressure and guilt off his family. So as an example, in my health care power of attorney, I have a, a paragraph about dementia that if I, don't any, if I don't recognize my family any longer, then I just want comfort care. And it's not a request, it's a demand. I just want comfort care. I don't want a feeding tube, I don't want an operation, I don't want anything like that. That's my desire, that may not be your desire, but that's the desire that I, I put into my documents. Let's talk about another case. Let's talk about a case where we've got a crisis. And so Mr. and Mrs. Reed um, uh, are a family that we worked with. Uh, Mrs. Reed came in. Uh, Mr. Reed has cancer. Uh, he's been discharged to the nursing home and he's paying $8,000 a month. Uh, the assets include Mr. Reed's uh, $80,000 or Mrs. Reed's $80,000 IRA, a home in a joint account of $60,000. Mrs. Reed was talking to the nursing home and was told that she needed to spend down all of her resources before Medicaid would help. And then that Medicaid was going to put a lien on her home. So she was worried about that, but she was also worried that her husband would not get good care if he went into the nursing home or while in the nursing home and if he went on Medicaid. So what happened is we were able to get Mr. Reed on Medicaid and we did it in such a way that Mrs. Reed kept all of the assets. We set it up so that, that um, uh, no lien was put on her home. Uh, I also want you to know that if Mr. Reed was able to go home, then we showed Mrs. Reed we could actually get VA benefits for him of $2,200 a month and that would be tax free. <laughs> so just be, want you to be aware that uh, there are VA pension benefits that are available for veterans that served during a wartime. Uh, in this particular case, Medicaid was the best solution for Mrs. Reed, but if he had come home and we wanted to pay for in-home care, then the VA was a great way to do that. So what do you need to do? Um, uh, again, schedule a, st a strategy session as soon as possible if you're concerned about uh, a designing a plan for long-term care. Uh, we, we want to explore with you all funding for sources that either you have now or that we could obtain uh, in the future. We really want to get uh, strong powers of attorneys and other estate planning documents. And the goal is that when we need it, that we're able to find, get, and pay for good care without going broke. That's a little bit of a mantra in our office. Uh, I wanna share a story with you uh, about Pat. So Pat came to us, uh, she had moved into Kansas uh, from out of state. She moved to be near some family uh, to help take care of her husband. Um, she came in, very angry. Uh, she was mad she had to see me. She was mad that her husband was sick. She was mad that she knew she couldn't take care of him much longer at home. Um, she was just mad at the world. Uh, and we worked with Pat for several years. In fact, Pat's still a client. But her husband has passed away. Uh, but she's really become a sweetheart. Uh, once we got her past this difficult journey. Let me read you uh, comments that she said uh, in a note to me. My husband needed nursing home care. You guided me through the process. Your care coordinators made sure my husband was getting good care. I highly recommend you because you are always there for your clients and will guide them through everything that goes on things we never expected to go through. 
luckily for Pat and us, when Pat came to see us, we were still able to do a lot of planning, both for she and her husband. He still had capacity. We were able to work, have our care coordinators. And a care coordinator is a person in our office that works with our families that are dealing with a chronic illness or um, aging issues. A um, couple of them are, are social workers and one's on our end. But I think sometimes there's a rumor, a coffee shop rumor, that if you go on Medicaid, you're not going to get good care. And that's simply not true. Uh, but anyway, we needed to give Pat peace of mind. We needed to, to take the pressure off of her as a caregiver and let her go back to, to being a, a wife and, and to let her know she wasn't going to lose everything. So let, let me, uh, anyway, Pat's great. I think she's actually done a, a video on our, our website. Let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, don't pay unnecessary taxes. And so I really don't have a lot. I could really talk about this all day. Just I want to make you aware of some stuff. Uh, the SECURE Act was passed uh, right at the beginning of the year of 2020. Uh, it had a profound effect on IRAs. Um, it used to be that if I left my IRA to my kids, they could take out that money over the remainder of their lifetime. That's no longer true. Now they have to take it out in 10 years. And so that has a, uh, an effect of making them pay more taxes quicker uh, than uh, what they used to do. Uh, you can still leave it to your wife uh, uh, and she can stretch it out over her lifetime, but your kids have a 10 year stretch uh, and that's it. And, and you still have to do it right because if you don't do it right, then it could end up being a one year stretch and every, all the money comes out at one time. We, got, we can make more contributions to an IRA even after 70 and a half, if we're working. That used to be the cutoff date. Now, even if you're working at 70 and a half, you could no longer make contributions. Uh, the CARES Act was passed. Uh, that is a COVID law. Just some things I want you to be aware of. You can borrow or you can take out of your IRA $100,000 if, if, you, if you've been impacted by COVID. You can, stre you can stretch the tax liability over three years. If you put the money back in at the end of, by the end of three years, your tax liability goes away. You can borrow from your 401k account up to $100,000, it used to be 50. You don't have to take required minimum distributions this year. Uh, you can, but you don't have to. And really kind of interesting, the, this is a great year to make contributions to charitable organizations. The credit for it is much better than it's been in several years. Uh, other taxes that we get concerned about are capital gains. Uh, there are Medicare taxes. And so the more income that you pay, the more income that you get, the higher your Medicare B premium is. I'm going to show you an illustration of that in a moment. Uh, if you have high income in a year, you have to pay a, an additional 3.8% tax on top of it. Uh, and where that really comes up is that if you sell some property and have capital gains, that can really push you up into that health care surtax. Most of my clients don't need to worry about this. In fact, I don't have any clients that need to worry about the federal estate tax doesn't kick in to 11.58, but we really need to worry about these other taxes. So uh, Mr. and Mrs. Augustine came to see, see me they wanted to transition the farm to the children. Their original idea was to sell it to the children. And the, the concerns that I had were they, were they were gonna pay a lot of capital gains taxes. 
in addition, it, uh, there would be taxes if the kids wanted to buy each other out, uh, particularly if they wanted to give it to the kids. Uh, once they gave it to the kids or sold it to the kids, they lost control. Uh, if they had a lot of capital gain gains, their Medicare premiums were going to go up and they were looking at a surtax of 3.8%. So our solution was to place the land into an irrevocable trust. What did that do for them? It allowed them to go ahead and give the income and if the, even the farming operation over to the kids. But now as a result, uh, the kids don't technically own the land until Mr. and Mrs. Augustine die. And as a result of that, then the kids get a favorable tax step up in basis. But importantly for the Augustines is they retain the right to change the beneficiaries. So if something happens to one of the kids, uh, they, could, they could basically take that kid off the land and they would have that control until the day both Mr. and Mrs. Augustine passed away. And by putting it into the irrevocable trust, they don't have a bunch of new taxes to pay. Uh, and again, the, you know, if they, if they had not done this, or as an example, their Medicare premiums would have jumped from $148 to $504 a month. And so just that, I know maybe that's not a big thing for a lot of people, but people really don't like to pay that additional Medicare. So finally, I wanna to talk to you about staying at home. And, and for many of my clients that really floats to the top. And I just share a personal story. And this is back to my grandmother. Uh, remember I took care of her. Uh, I, I didn't tell you that, uh, when I took over her care, she had three to six months to live. Um, uh, and actually she went on hospice twice. Well, that, that three to six months uh, turned out to be 10 years. Uh, she had a lot of, lot of issues going on. Uh, but on my journey with her, originally we were able to arrange for some resources in the community in Fort Worth. Uh, that kind of worked out. Uh, we moved her to uh, uh, then from Texas uh, uh, to, to Kansas. Uh, only one assisted living facility would take her. All the other ones, she was on hospice. All the other ones would not. Uh, and um, she went into the assisted living facility and guess what happened? She got better. We reduced her medications from 14 to four. She stayed in that assisted living for four years. Uh, at the very end of her life, uh, she spent 50 days in a nursing home and she died at the age of 96. So what were the lessons for me? That with proper guidance, uh, you can stay at home uh, much longer. Uh, your transitions can be gradual. It's not an option of, your, your, your home versus a nursing home, there can be a lot of things in between. Support for get caregivers is critical. And I mean, uh, that can be financial support, it can be resources, it can be a lot of things, but support for the caregiver is critical. And, and your resources can be stretched to achieve those goals, which is what we, I did with, my, with MAMO. Just a, a cute saying from my grandmother, she had a lot of them. She said, honey, I know someday I will have to go to the nursing home. I just don't want to know about it. And what she meant by that, as long as she was cognitive, she wanted to be at home. She wanted to be an independent. Even in assisted living, she felt like she was in control and she was. So what do you need to do if you're wanting to stay at home is get, schedule a strategy session uh, if you're concerned about developing a, aging or chronic care issues. And, We'll talk about how that fits into your plan. Uh, don't wait. The longer you wait, the greater the crisis and the more limited the options. And, and again, don't give up. There are solutions. I want to talk to you a little bit about, what, about JB. So JB came to us and he, both his parents 
were had chronic illnesses and they really wanted to stay in the home. And JB was at his wits end. But we were able to keep uh, his parents in the home for many years. Eventually, I think it was his mother died first and his father was not able to stay at home uh, after that. And we transitioned him to the nursing home, but we continued to monitor his care. Uh, and JB, even though he had siblings, carried the water the whole way on this thing. And so I, I it, it was a very stoic guy. So I, this is, this is heartfelt uh, from him uh, when he said, I felt very comfortable with everyone I worked with. Clink Scales helped us through some very hard years. Uh, and I really admired the, the journey that, uh, of uh, him. So, so far you've discovered there are important uh, components and considerations for your long-term plan. Uh, there are ways to preserve and protect your resources and assets. If you, and if you do need long-term care, you don't have to go broke. With planning, you can avoid uh, unnecessary taxes uh, to the government. Uh, with proper care and planning, you can delay or, and avoid the nursing home allowing you to stay at home longer. And as my grandmother liked to say, uh, she got to save a lot of money by staying uh, out of the nursing home. So I, I really hope you get this one thing uh, with proper planning uh, with an expert, it allows you to achieve your, your long range goals and protect your wishes, uh, your family and your property. So again, Proper planning with an expert allows you to achieve your long-term range goals and protect your wishes, your family, and your property. So I hope that that's your takeaway here. How do you make that happen? Uh, we've talked about the secrets to know, you need to know for the second half of life, the important components that you need, ways to preserve and protect your assets. You don't wanna pay unnecessary taxes and you need to design a plan that allows you to stay at home. So how does this work? As Emily talked about, uh, we'll actually schedule a 60 to 90 minute strategy session uh, in person or by Zoom or, or by telephone with me or one of our other attorneys. Uh, at that meeting, we'll discuss your financial and legal needs. We'll review your current estate plan or lack of estate plan. We'll review your concerns regarding preserving and protecting your assets and what are your wishes. We'll establish with you long-term goals. We'll discuss the tax consequences. And then I'll answer, or the attorney will answer uh, your uh, unique uh, situation. And believe me, everybody's got a unique situation. They, they really do. Uh, at the end of our time together, you'll have a better clarity of your issues and goals. And we'll, we'll help you establish those long-term goals. We'll develop a plan for your second half of life, and you'll know what documents and other tools that we need to get in place. And we'll show you a blueprint on how to achieve uh, those goals. And you'll know the exact investment to achieve the goals. After our meetings, uh, what will happen is you'll decide to get started We'll develop a written plan uh, based on what we talked about. We'll work with you to implement that plan uh, and we'll prepare all the legal documents to reflect your goals and objectives. Uh, then we want to schedule another meeting to review, sign and implement uh, the documents and the tools. Uh, after that, then we'll continue to work with you on other tools and other steps such as how property is to be titled and the like in order to keep, keep make the plan work. And, and most importantly, we're going to walk you through the process from start to finish. So the consultation typically is $450. It's gonna be free because you attended today. Uh, again, I don't know where Ashley comes up with these slides, but she did. Uh, we're, we're, we've got eight spots we've set aside during the next four weeks. Uh, to, to schedule a time, call our office at 877-325-8040, or we're going to send you an, an email with a Survey Monkey link that you can check on. And just to let you know, when you call that, actually we're going to interview you, uh, uh, Tracy will interview short, you shortly, 
uh, with a short interview, uh, make sure that it's something we can help you with, and then she'll schedule an appointment and let you know what all you need to bring uh, for that or have or make available uh, to us for that appointment. So my guarantee to you is after we get done is you're gonna more, know more than you did today. You're gonna have an analysis of what happens if you do nothing and your time's not gonna be wasted. Again, here's the, the number for the free strategy session and to contact our office and we'll send that survey monkey. Uh, and in addition, we're going to, as a gift for the, the meeting, we're going to send you uh, a book, What You Really Know for the Second Half of Life. And I wrote a chapter in that book that you'll see. And we'll also provide you a written summary of uh, the recommendations. So remember a free strategy session and an analysis of your current plan, uh, a, a written report to achieve your goals and, and the book. And again, call the number or get the survey uh, through the monkey link. Uh, so I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Emily. And Emily, anything you need to add? Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions right now at the moment. Um, but if you have any last minute questions, or if, as I mentioned before, if you have a private question about your unique situation, um, please message me now in the chat box and let me know that way I can put you in a private room with Randy and one of our staff members, Tracy. Um, as Randy mentioned, that survey link, I put it in the chat box, so you should see that showing up now. Um, and that is to redeem your free strategy session and that free book. Um, the follow-up email from us here at Clink Skills will include that link, um, so please be sure to take advantage of that. The email will also include the recorded video of this presentation um, for you to refer back to or share with others. So that is in the chat box, as I mentioned. So please be, be um, get a hold of us really quickly. We did have one question just come in, Randy. Um, yep. It looks like the question says, um, you mentioned that this was the best year for charitable contributions. What could you specify what exactly you meant by that? Yeah, and so uh, typically uh, uh, right now, whether you itemize or not, this year you can take a, th a $300 deduction um, and, and that's uh, deducted from your uh, adjusted gross income. If you itemize, uh, in addition, it used to be restricted to 60%, you could only, there's a, a limit on how much you could donate. Uh, uh, it was based on uh, a percentage of your gross, adjusted gross income. This year, there's no, no percentage. So 100% of the donation will come off your adjusted gross income. So it really does, uh, it really is a, a good year to uh, even make your donations not only for this year, but even for next year, because uh, I don't think that'll be available next year. It could be, but but you know we've not had this in a while, so it really is a a good time to uh, to make that donation. Great, thank you very much for addressing that question. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more at the moment. Um, so we just want to conclude by letting you know that we really appreciate your attendance today and want to thank you for joining us for the session. Um, we encourage everyone to please keep an eye out on our website for any more upcoming events. And our website is elderlawkansas.com. Um, please feel free to call or message us like Randy already spoke about earlier with any questions at all. Um, and so we'll go ahead and thank you, Randy, for a fantastic presentation. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, please have a great rest of your day and Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everyone.